We're going through the Gospel of John, and we're in chapter 17, where we have the privilege of listening to God the Son pray to God the Father. And it's a very uh, moving chapter, a very enlightening chapter, as you'll see. Uh, this morning, we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. Uh, having covered the previous verses, but well, let's go back and read those previous verses, beginning with verse 1. Uh, maybe the Lord will recall to your memory some of the things we've learned already, and then we'll focus on verses 6 through 8. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 17 said, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee, before the world was. I have manifested my name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I am come out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll pray silently now as we ask him to help us to uh, understand these words. Father, you have given us your spirit each and every believer has the indwelling spirit to help us to learn and to understand the word of God. And so we call upon him now to teach us, uh, use me as his mouthpiece, as his spokesman, and glorify yourself now through the preaching of the word in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, I don't pray the same way in my prayer closet as I do here publicly, and you don't either. I suppose if I could eavesdrop on your prayers in your home, in your bedroom late at night, or you could eavesdrop on my prayers at nighttime or whenever I'm alone in my prayer closet, you'd learn something about me, right? You would learn what I'm concerned about, uh, what I would like to see the Lord do, and so on and so forth, and I would learn about you. Well, that's what we're doing here. We're listening to Jesus pray to his father, and we're learning a lot about him. What's on his mind? What's he concerned about? What's he praying for in this private prayer that the disciples got to listen in on and John recorded for us here? The main way that Jesus describes his people in this prayer in chapter 17 is that they are those whom God the Father gave to him in eternity past. He speaks of believers as the people whom thou hast given him. No fewer than five times in this prayer. He's concerned and he's praying about those that the Father had given him. And that raises the question, namely, who are these people? Who are those who belong to Jesus by the sovereign, eternal choosing of God the Father? In one sense, this is a question that we cannot answer and maybe we shouldn't even be asking. We're not allowed to look into the book of life that Revelation 13, 18, and 20, 15 speak of. This is the book that records the identity of all of God's people, and it was written in eternity past. Likewise, the Bible never tells us to get, go about being anxious about whether we are the elect, even though 2 Peter 2, 10 does remind us to give diligence to make sure your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. But Peter doesn't tell us to make ourselves elect somehow or to give evidence of our election. Or, or, or He doesn't want us to get all that concerned about it. He just wants to make sure that we are the elect. 
asking questions like, am I one of the elect or is he or she one of the elect? That's a question that the Bible never does endorse. But having made that clear, Jesus' prayer does answer the question, who are the people that God has given to, to the Son before the foundation of the world? And he gives four marks of those people in verses 6 through 8. And that's what we'll be looking at this morning. The people of Christ are those whom Jesus manifested the Father's name, whom Christ took out of the world, who have kept God's word, and who received Jesus as the one sent from God. So when God chose people and gave them to Christ, those people were also brought into a saving relationship with the Father. And they then become important to God's saving mission here on earth. Verse 6 says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. What does manifest mean? Manifest, the definition is to display or show a quality or feeling by one's acts or appearance. It means to demonstrate. And so Jesus is saying, I have demonstrated God's name to these that you have given me for the foundation of the world. And this is a fulfillment of Psalm chapter 22 and verse 22 that says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Now in previous sermons, we've mentioned how Christ revealed the glory of God in terms of his perfect attributes. Jesus' life, and especially his sacrificial death, it displays God's power, it displays God's holiness, it displayed God's truth and love. But here we're reminded of the names that God revealed in the Old Testament. In biblical times, the name of a person was understood to, to sum up that person, to say something about that person. And to know the name of God, then, is to possess a, a knowledge of God, a way of salvation. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 18.10, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. We know God because his name has been made known to us by Christ. Jesus revealed God's name in a way that the disciples had never dreamed of before. And in doing so, we, he widened their understanding of the nature of God. And he does that for us as well. Now, we learn a lot about God by the means of his scriptural names. The first scriptural name of God was Elohim which teaches us that God is the creator. It's used in the Bible's very first verse. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Later on in the Bible, a derivative of the name is combined with other words to teach us more about God's work and about who he is. He is El Shaddai, meaning God Almighty, Genesis 17.1. He is El Roi, God who sees me, Genesis 16.3. Abraham named him El Elyon, God Most High, in Genesis 14.22. The other great name of God in the Old Testament is Yahweh, which is God's covenant name as Israel's Redeemer. If you recall Moses, when he was meeting with God by that burning bush, he asked him, what name should I tell these people? What is your name? Do I tell the people of yours in Egypt? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent you. In the Hebrew, that I am in the Old Testament is written in four letters. Y-H-W-E. That is what I am spells out in the Hebrew. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, Jewish people came to speak of the name of God, Yahweh, in reference to these letters. And in reverence to God, they refused to speak that name out loud. In later years, when vowels were inserted into the Hebrew text, this name was given the vowel pointing to the, for the word Adonai, meaning Lord, and uh, in, in place of the original vowels. And the letters didn't quite fit the consonants, which was the point since it renders the name kind of unpronounceable. And the best attempt at rendering that name was Jehovah. Most people agree today that, that Yahweh is more likely the original name. 
Other versions of that name include Yahweh Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, meaning the Lord will provide, Genesis twenty two fourteen. 14. Uh, Yahweh or Jehovah Sabaoth, meaning the Lord of hosts, 1 Samuel 1, 3. There can be no doubt, though, that Jesus revealed the meaning of these names of God to the disciples as he was teaching them over the last three years. They had a full understanding about what Yahweh was all about, what Jehovah was all about. Some scholars argue that Jesus means here that he is revealing a new name of God, and he is. And this new name of God can be none other than Father. This is what he's revealing to them. It's true that Israel occasionally referred to God as Father, as in the case of Isaiah 64, 8. But the idea that individual believers could call upon the Lord as Father was only revealed through Jesus Christ. Jesus himself constantly prayed to God as Father, and he urged his disciples to do likewise. After the resurrection, you might recall, Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. As, was, as a result of his return to heaven, Jesus' disciples would enjoy the same relationship to God the Father as Jesus enjoyed to his Father. This is the name he's revealing to him. Now, Jesus' emphasis on manifesting God's name reminds us of the importance of knowing God. Nothing is more important for us than to know God as he is revealed in the pages of the Bible and especially as he has manifested in Christ. The only way for Christians to live in faith and in hope and in love is to know God as the sovereign, loving, holy, powerful, just, and good God that he is. Many American Christians say they worship God, but it's a God of their own making, not a God of the scriptures. Knowing God's name is a priority that never takes a back seat. In this respect, our spiritual progress throughout life can be tracked by our growth in the knowledge of the name of the Lord. And hopefully you've grown a little already as a result of this sermon. Now the point in Jesus' prayer is that his knowledge of God's name is revealed only to his people, and this knowledge is the mark of the people of Christ. Another way to say this is this Christians are, are not to pray like this. O oh, high, exalted, and unknowable God, beyond the reach and majesty, aloof beyond the petty concerns of men. No, we pray like this. Our Father, the Almighty, Most High, all-seeing God, who is with us to save us and bless us. Now, do you know God in that way, as your Father? If you do not, then Jesus calls you to himself, for it is he alone who manifests the name of the Father of God's name to you. It's the only way. So as you come to know Jesus, receive him in true faith, and embrace the truth of his word, Jesus will reveal to you the knowledge of the only true God, which brings eternal life. That's one of the marks of one of those whom God has given to the Son. A second characteristic of the people of Christ is that they have been taken out of the world. Jesus prays, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. So here we see that Christians have been separated out of the world and are called to live in a different way, manifesting a new power. According to the Bible, there is a great division amongst mankind. There are some who belong to this world, and there are others who have been separated by God out of the world. And that's really the only two divisions that exist in humanity today. In the world, out of the world. You're either one or the other. This relates to the doctrine of sanctification, coming from the Latin word sanctus, which means holy. Christians are separated from the world and called to be holy. Now, to understand this doctrine of sanctification, we need to understand three points to get this teaching right. 
The first is we, we tend to speak of sanctification, this process of becoming more holy, as something that follows after our justification. That is our, our acceptance by God because Jesus has justified us by paying for our sins. And this is true. Those who believe in Jesus are forgiven of all their sins. They are justified by God and then are called to holy living. But we also need to realize that sanctification is not something that comes sometimes later on for believers as some kind of an add-on to salvation. Rather, sanctification is, is, is very necessary right at the beginning of salvation. It starts immediately. Christians are those, Jesus says, which thou gavest me out of the world. And from that moment of our faith in Christ, we are set apart by God from the world. Though we're still in it, we are no longer of it. Second, sanctification means no longer living in a worldly manner. Uh, what is a worldly person? A worldly person is one whose mind is on the things of the world. What does the world think about? They think about money. They think about prestige. They think about pleasure. They think about fame. Those are the things of the world, and that's what the world is after. Christians no longer live for those things. In addition, followers of Christ no longer live by the values of the world. You recall John wrote in his first epistle, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. John was pretty serious about this lack of worldliness, was he not? Turning to the Apostle Paul, we see sanctification spoken of in a variety of ways. In Romans 6, Paul focuses on dying to sin so as we live to God. We no longer could cultivate sinful practices and desires. He wrote in Romans 6, 11 and 12, Likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. In Philippians 3.20, Paul describes believers as no longer being citizens of the world, but citizens of heaven. Our allegiance is no longer to the world because the world's authority over us has been supplanted by the authority of Christ. In Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, Paul reminds us that we are taught that we should put off concerning the former conversation, that means behavior, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. All of these statements make it very clear that one cannot be a Christian without being different from the world. So why in the world are churches trying to be more and more like the world? It baffles me to no end. Let's bring the world into our church to attract the world. No, we need to be 100% different from the world. And they'll be attracted to us that way. They'll be attracted to Christ that way. It just blows my mind why we've got that thinking so, so, so wrapped up in evangelical Christianity today. For sure, we continue to be plagued by sin throughout this life. And we continue to be influenced by the world. But Christ's people no longer have the same relationship to sin and the world than we used to have. Pastor Sinclair Ferguson wrote this, speaking of Christians, they belong to a new family in which sin is not the order of the day. Instead, righteousness, peace, and joy mark the family of life as God's people. And he cites Romans 14, 17. We are the kind of people who have begun to taste that deliverance from the reign of sin, which will be consummated at the regeneration 
of all things. That's from his book, Children of the Living God. Third thing we need to understand about sanctification is to realize that while we are separated from the world, ultimately sanctification is separated to God. And there's a difference. In the Bible, holy things were those things that were not only taken away from worldly use, but they were also designed for God's possession and his service. For instance, Mount Zion was holy. It was sanctified because God's holy temple was built there. In the temple, they had these, and in the tabernacle, they had these vessels. They had these cups and these plates and so on and so forth. Those were utensils that were used strictly for the service of God and the holy men as priests who were the only ones who were allowed to touch them. So these were holy things. These were sanctified. They were set apart unto God for his use and for his use only. For us to be holy is to know the reality of Nehemiah's exclamation, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So it's very important that we embrace this positive idea of sanctification so we don't ultimately define holy as being different from the world, but also as offering ourselves unto God. That's just as important. See, Paul wrote, God hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The purpose that we are the ones given to Christ by the Father is for us to belong to God for the sake of his glory. We have been separated for that purpose. When we understand that distinction, it makes all the difference in our attitude toward Christian living. We're not trying to be holy simply by not attending movies or by avoiding certain worldly ways of dressing. That's the kind of church I was raised in. You know, here's what it not means not to be in the world. You don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't dance, you don't go to movies, you don't play pool, you don't wear wire rimmed glasses, you don't wear this, you don't do that, you don't have to cut your hair a certain way, and then you're holy. That's not what we're talking about here. We become holy as we increasingly want to be near to God, living in such a way that's pleasing to God and more and more filling our hearts with the delight of his truth and his grace. That's what holiness means. The result of this positive holiness will most definitely include being different from the world. But in our thinking, we will not be impressed so much with how different we are or how better we are or how we think we're better than them, but we will be more thrilled with knowing and serving God and growing in the wonder of his grace. I know lots of people who call themselves Christians. They think they're better. I'm better than you. I'm a better Christian than you. They'll brag about, I only go to see PG movies. Well, then someone else might have that. Well, we only go to see G movies. Aren't we sanctified? And someone else will say, well, we don't even go to movies. Those are worldly. Well, not only do we not only go to, not move, go to movies, we don't watch television. On and on and on it goes. That's not what this is all about. It is growing in the knowledge and the service of God and seeing the wonder of his grace, which separates us. That's sanctification. This, by the way, gives the key to Christian liberty. It's true that believers have freedom when it comes to matters that are not forbidden in the scripture, including a proper viewing of movies, the way we dress, the enjoyment of sports or the arts. You can do that to a certain extent, even though those things might be of the world. But we have to realize that the true freedom for which we were purchased by Christ is the liberty to draw near to God in holiness and in love. As David saying, behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That's what we have been separated for. In all things, therefore, we should live in order to promote our nearness to God and to encourage the spiritual blessing of others in Christ. The third aspect of Christ's people is that they keep God's word. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, 
and they have kept thy word. The word keep means to, to lay hold of and to secure. Examples of how it's used in John might help to make its meaning clear. John 8, 51, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Later in chapter 14 and verse 15, he stated, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And then he added, If a man love me, he will keep my words. So it's clear that Jesus is meaning not simply just assenting to his teachings, but embracing it in a lifestyle of obedience. That's what it means to keep his word. Now, during Jesus' ministry, there were multitudes who heard his teaching, but did not keep his word. We think of this great mass of people that he fed with the loaves and the fishes, but they choked on his teaching. They complained in John 6, 60, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And they didn't. But the people of Christ are so different from this, they keep God's word. That's the difference. This doesn't mean that they don't, uh, uh, simply that they don't walk away, that they don't offer some objections, and that they, or they just nod their head in agreement. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, you do not really keep the word of God unless you obey it. It is a word that cannot be kept only in your intellect. It has to be put in your heart and in your will also. The man who keeps the word of God is the man whose whole personality is keeping it. The man who is meditating and rejoicing in it, whose heart warms to it and so obeys it. That's a good way to understand what it means to keep the word of God. This reminds us of what, uh, that while we emphasize keeping as obeying, John's meaning also includes treasuring God's word. How will the people of Christ, whose word increasingly shapes our mind, will, and what we love, how does that, how does that work? And the answer is keeping the scriptures as our prized resource. Solo scriptura was the mantra of the reformers. And Psalm 1 that Paul read this morning, where the man of God is contrasted to the man who walks in the counsel of the world, we are told his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth he sh uh, shall prosper. That's what it means to keep the word of God. We delight in it. So if I were to come as your pastor this morning and tell you a few funny jokes, get you all laughing, and, and then tell you some story of, of some event that happened in my life and go on and on for about 30 minutes with this whole big long story, and then I conclude with some kind of emotional plea and tell, oh, dead grandma's up in the sky and she wants you to believe in Jesus. And, and you would not be happy with that if you love the word of God. You would say, what are you doing, pastor? Open up the word of God to us. That's what we delight in. Those are the people that are keeping God's word. They're not satisfied with anything less. So the people of Christ are those whom Jesus has manifested God's name who are taken out of the world and who keep God's word. And finally, Christ's people are those who receive Jesus as the Savior sent from God. Jesus said in verses 7 and 8, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. Jesus had described his people in their relationship to God, in their relationship to the world, and their relationship to the Word of God. And finally, the people of God are known by their having received Jesus himself as he has been given to us by the Father in heaven. So seeing that everything in Jesus is of God, his people receive Jesus as the sum and the fulfillment of the Word of God. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, 
and they have received them. It's an important truth that Christ's people keep God's word, but Jesus here emphasizes that keeping God's word directs us to Jesus himself. See, the Pharisees, they thought they were keeping God's word with their radical obedience, not only to the law, but their own add-ons to the traditions. They thought they were keeping God's word by, by not wearing sandals on the Sabbath and only walking a certain distance so it wouldn't be considered work on the Sabbath. And they had all these rules and regulations, just like the legalists today, you know, they think they're so holy because they don't go to movies or because they don't watch TV or, or they don't wear certain clothes. That's what the Pharisees were like. Those were the people that didn't get it. They weren't really keeping God's word. They had all their rules and regulations, those Pharisees did, and yet they rejected Jesus Christ. Christ said, I'm the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. And earlier he said, and the sheep hear his voice and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him and they know his voice. That's what sanctification does. That's what the people of God do. They follow Jesus. They keep his word and they follow him. His word points them back to Jesus. Because Christ's people hear the call of Jesus in God's word, Jesus' conclusion was this, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Think about the response of the apostle Paul's teaching to the Greek city in Berea. The Jews valued God's word in the Old Testament. And when Paul arrived in any particular city, his usual MO was to go to the synagogue and start preaching to the Jewish people how Jesus Christ had fulfilled everything that was foretold in the Old Testament scriptures. Usually Paul's teaching was received by the Jews in violent rejection. In fact, Paul had just gone to Berea to escape the violence that he experienced in Thessalonica. But his hearers in Berea were willing to pay attention and to consider Jesus in the light of the scriptures. Luke wrote about this in Acts 17, verses 11 and 12. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. This is the mark of God's people, that they have compared the claims of Jesus with the teachings of the whole Bible, and have found that Jesus is, in fact, the one foretold by God in the Old Testament scriptures. It might be that Christ's people sometimes don't understand everything in the Bible correctly. I don't think I understand everything in the Bible correctly. I know I'm going to get to heaven and, and, and I'm going to see the truth. And I didn't present the truth the way it really was. I thought I was doing right. And there's other people that will do that. And I'm sure some of you out there don't have everything right as well. We don't understand everything correctly. We, we might have much yet to learn about holiness and much holiness still to attain but we do know this, Jesus is the Savior promised by God in the scriptures. Jesus prayed in verse 8, And they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. This statement means that the way for you to know that you have joined the people of Christ, the way to know if you are one of those given by the Father to him, is by opening the Bible. And there you will read the account of Jesus' life, his ministry, his doctrine, and examining Jesus' claim to be the one who fulfills God's ancient promises and promises salvation. Now, according to Jesus, faith is not something we have in and of ourselves, but rather something given to us by God. Notice how often Jesus uses the terms gave or given in this passage. If you want to count them up, there's five times. This is why Paul says that salvation and faith are gifts from God. 
That's why we quote almost every sermon, for by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Always cautioning people, do not look to something you did to save yourself. If you did, you're not saved. If you're boasting about anything, you are not saved. Faith is a gift. Salvation is a gift. You have nothing to boast of. You just receive out of the grace of God. This means if you're struggling to receive Christ, or if you are unsure, if you're one of the people of Christ that we talked about this morning, you should ask God to give you faith and salvation. The late great Benjamin Morgan Palmer tells of a meeting in his study with a man who had been attending his church without, as of yet, having believed in Christ. Came into the office and he complained about Palmer's recent, recent preaching about faith alone and that only comes as God's gift and yet sinners have to believe in order to avoid condemnation. How does that work? And Palmer, he still looked down at the manuscript that he'd been working on, and he answered, Well, my dear friend, there's no use in our quarreling over this matter. Either you can believe or you cannot. If you can, all I have to say is that I hope that you will just go and do it. Still not looking at the man so as not to distract him, Palmer could hear the man, his voice was choking. And he replied, I would try my best for three whole days and cannot. Ah, Palmer said, now, laid down his pen and looked the guy in the eye and he said, that puts a different face on it. We will go then and tell the difficulty straight to God. And here's how we reported what happened next. We knelt together and I prayed in the most matter of fact style as though this was the first time in human history this trouble had ever arisen. And here was a soul in the most desperate extremity which must, believe, which must believe or perish, and hopelessly unable of itself to do it. That consequently, it was just the case of calling for divine interposition and pleading most earnestly for the fulfillment of the divine promise. Upon rising, I offered not a single word of comfort or advice, so I left my friend and in his powerlessness and in the hands of God as the only helper. In a short time, he came through the struggle, rejoicing in the hope of eternal life. In the end, as in the beginning, faith in Jesus is the gift of God. This is just as the people of Christ are those whom the Father has given to the Son. Do you want to be listed among them? Do you want to receive eternal life, then ask the Father, who gives grace in Jesus' name. Father, give me faith in your grace and your mercy. Save me. And he will. He promises he'll not, he'll not cast anyone aside who comes to him in faith. For surely in this matter, above all other, Jesus' promises is true. Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Ask in the name of the Father, through Jesus Christ the Savior, Father, save me. Give me that faith. By your grace, have mercy upon me. And he will. And he will. You have no excuse. You'll not stand before God someday and say, no one ever told me about this. I have told you the good news. Sinners like you can be saved and shall be saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, but any men should boast. Ask the Father and he shall save you. Let's pray. Father, my prayer is that as we leave this building this morning, everyone who leaves this building will leave knowing that they are one of the ones that you gave to the Son, that the Son is praying for, that we'll learn next week that these are the only ones he's praying for. May we all leave here knowing and, and, and convinced that we are the children of God, not by anything we've done, 
forgive us if we turn back to works and say, well, I'm a child of God because I do this or I don't do this or I have done this. But we're children of God because of you and your sovereign grace. Thank you for those of us who know that we're truly your people. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, Father, for giving us to the Son. Thank you for making that come to a reality in our own minds and hearts when you gave us faith and we repented and believed. And my prayer is that every man, woman, and child will leave here knowing that they are a child of God. And if not, dear Lord, save them. Open up their blind eyes. Let them see the truth of the gospel. Give them faith. Give them repentance. Save your people and do so to glorify yourself. Don't save them for themselves. Save them for you. Christ wanted you to have all glory. We want Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to have all glory, especially in this area of salvation. May you have received glory this morning through our worship, through the reading of your word, through the preaching of your word. And now be pleased with us as we depart this morning from this glorious time of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.